All right, if you have your Bibles uh, this morning, thank you for the testimonies, and it's good to, to lift up the name of the Lord and let others know what he has done and what he's going to do and be praying one for another. Uh, okay, I was thinking uh, we're going to be in uh, the book of Proverbs in chapter 6. I, uh, I, some of you are, are do, doing the, uh, the prayer journal, the, the Seek God for the City, and one of the days this last week, uh, there was a uh, there was a one of the one of the prayer uh, things there, where uh, it was talking about revival, and uh, the revival uh, they they said in the prayer journal, journal that the if we you know when we pray for revival in our city or for our country we always think of things that we think need to be fixed things that need to be changed and repaired. And it said in there, you know, the first thing we need to look at where we need to begin is not something out there, but right here. This is, this is where revival needs to begin. And I was thinking uh, how we have misrepresented God in much of what, in our, many of our churches and many of what passes for evangelism and so forth. And uh, for years, for years, God was represented as like an ogre who as soon as you've done something wrong, he's going to just come and smash you. And then, and then the pendulum has swung the other way. Now we present God as like a, a, a dementia old grandfather who just loves, you know, who's just everything is just fine, you know. But how many people know God is a God of love? He loves and God hates. He loves and he hates. Just like you, we're created in God's image. You love, right? You have things, people you love and things you love. But anybody here has, have anything they hate? And I'm not talking about hating people maliciously. I'm not talking about that. You know, we love our kids, but we hate some of the things they do. I mean, sometimes you like to strangle them, right? <laughs> we hate some of the things they do because we know it's harmful to them and we see them hurting themselves. God loves and God hates. And I wanted this morning to, to, that we can get a clear picture. We can really understand God's love. I think if we can really understand it, we need to understand what he hates. And that makes his love so much more, so much more brilliant to us. And in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to read, uh, actually we're going to start at verse 12, okay? Now it's going to be a little rough at the beginning, but it's going to end up good, okay? <laughs> so don't, I don't want to lose nobody. Uh, this, this section of Proverbs deals with things that God hates. And, and, and if you read Proverbs, it's a book of wisdom, and it talks about things that's important to understand. It begins in verse 12 with a naughty person. You see that in the King James? Now, that, when we hear that word naughty, it, it doesn't really have the, the same effect that it did uh, 600 years ago when they translated the King James. Uh, it, if, if we were to translate it today, we would... We would we would use the word uh, good for nothing. Uh, anybody ever hear that? Yeah, he's good for nothing. Uh, wicked. The, the Hebrew word is the word Belial. And if you ever heard, read the sons of Belial, sons of wickedness and so forth. Uh, I want you to just read this a little bit, and then we're going to go down to the, to the things that God hates. But just to, uh, to get this and see if, if maybe you, this reminds you of anybody or maybe, you know, You've been here at one time or another. It says, a naughty person, a wicked man, walks with a froward mouth. Now, that's another word that you never, nobody ever uses, froward. You know, it sounds like a, sounds like a position on a, on a basketball team. It's not it. Froward means perverse. It means, it means something uh, determined to go against what's, what is expected, perverse. Uh, now, my generation was a froward generation. You know, when I grew up, our generation was rebellious and, and you, know, uh, you know, we're not going to take it and, and all that, you know. And that's, that's the way we were. We were forward. I guess every generation is like it to a, to a point. But we, we grew up in that, in that time of rebellion. Okay, it says, uh, it says this. It says, uh, the, he walks with a froward or perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He speaks with his feet. He teaches with his fingers. You get the picture. You know, people that work covertly, people with an agenda. People with, with a purpose that they don't reveal. Manipulators. Users. Okay, anybody know any like that? Has anybody found, and be honest with yourself, have you ever been in a place where you tried to? Okay. 
See, we always, we always want to think about the other ones, but sometimes, okay, just read a little bit more. He said, forwardness is in his heart. He devises mischief continually. He sows discord. Troublemaker. <laughs> Troublemaker, all right? Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Now, now with that picture in mind that God gives us of a, of a, of a, of a naughty, of a good for nothing, of a son of Belial, now he dissects all that. I'm, 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 I'm doing this this morning so we could take a good look at somebody said this morning. We need, to, we need to look at ourselves first. If we really want to understand and appreciate the love of God, we need to understand how much he really loves us. Okay? Listen to what he says. These six things does the Lord hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. That word abomination means it disgusts him. You know, there are things that disgust you. I'm disgusted. When you read the newspaper, say, I'm disgusted. You look at Fox News or CNN, I'm disgusted. Okay, because it's, it's uh, well, there are things that disgust God. He's human. He may create us in his image. If there's things that disgust us, there must be things that disgust him. Here's, here's what they are. He, he lists the things that he doesn't like. It begins with, really, the foundation of everything. A proud look. Pride. Pride. Pride is the foundation, really, of every sin. Uh, you know, our, our rebellion, our unwillingness to submit to a higher authority. I'm too proud. God's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. That's, that's the basis of man's sin, our pride. Again, I, I, grew, up, I grew up in a, in a uh, 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 my generation, where our thing was like, you know, if it feels good, do it. You know. Baby, if it feels good, you know. I mean, you can remember some of them songs, you know, power to the people, and stuff. And uh, you're not going to tell me. And we just rebelled against anything that was considered normal or considered right. You know, I found out as I got older, I started realizing all that stuff, all that rebellion stuff was just really pretty stupid. You know, there was a reason why they taught, they tried to teach us all those things because that's the way it's supposed to work. But but no, nobody, you know, our, my, our generation was a proud, rebellious you know, we're not going to take it. A proud look. It disgusts God. And when we, listen, when we, when we follow after, there are those people who are, in, who are in prominent positions, entertainers, sports figures, politicians, whatever, who are in places where people look and respect them, and they, and they present that kind of attitude or that kind of, uh, that kind of rebellion, that they're going to be held accountable, even as it was said here this morning. They're going to be held accountable. For the people that, that lead them astray, you know, because we're given to idols. We're given to, to, to looking at people and things and, and worshiping people and things. If we're not worshiping God, we'll find something to worship or somebody. A proud look. Man, there's a whole lot of people that buy in. They like that proud look. God says he hates it. And God says he hates it. He goes on and he says, a lying Tongue, come on. How many people here like liars? <laughs> liars. Now, let's be honest. Have you ever told a lie? Oh, no, not me. <laughs> well, you just did. <laughs> if you say that. Maybe, maybe just a little lie. See, we like, we, like to, we like to separate. We say, well, there's like big lies. And then there's them little lies. You know, I like, that, I like that commercial that they had on there where Abraham Lincoln, his wife is there. You know, it's Abraham Lincoln never told a lie, you know. And his wife says, How, does this make me look fat? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln just didn't say anything. All right. <laughs> every once in a while. We, every once Come on. But you know what? A lie is a lie. God hates a lying tongue. Especially, especially deliberately trying to manipulate or confuse or take advantage of a lying tongue. See, this is getting pretty stiff now because some of these things, it's like the Ten Commandments. Some of them we can say, I never did that. But some of them, let's face it, when it gets down to the very inside of us, every one of us in this room, including me, has that little compartment in our heart, some is bigger than others, that will tell a lie. If it's convenient, if we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, if it would just get us out of a situation, come on. 
God hates it. Somebody says, man, I, this is, I think I'm going to leave. Okay. okay. Keep listening. I'm done. I'm not going to be long. Hands that shed innocent blood. A murderous and cruel disposition. You maybe have never shed blood. But what did Jesus say? If you hate somebody with your heart, it's like, you know, you might not have murdered them, but it's like, it's an attitude against people wanting to get vengeance, wanting to get even, wanting to get, right? God hates it. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked imagination. See, this is, he's, he's dissecting the, the one that we read about up there in those verses before. He's, he's giving us the anatomy, really, of a wicked person. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Thoughts of iniquity. Just think about what you turn over in your brain sometimes. Evil imaginations. We might look good on the outside. We can be very good on presenting ourselves a certain way on the outside. But what is going on in the mind? What's going on in your mind? So, you know, you can smile at people, and inside you're thinking, man, I'd like to throw a brick at them. Come on. You can make plans, and, and how am I going to, this is an agenda. You can have agendas that you want to accomplish. Wicked imaginations. I believe everybody in this room has at one time or another f- fallen into that position. Feet that be swift with running to, in running to mission. Just can't wait to get there. Debauchery. You know, our problem is we've fallen in love with sin. We love sin. We love, we love how it feels. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We love it. It's in our flesh. We say, wow, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get to the club. I can't wait to get to the party. I can't wait to get, man, I can't wait to get, I can't wait to get there. Just a few more things. I'm, verse 19, a false witness that speaks lies. And somebody said, we already talked about a lying tongue, but this takes it a step further. Not only are you lying, but you're lying about somebody. This is perjury. Bearing false witness against somebody. Slandering. Malicious speaking. Oh, come on. See, see, some might call it gossip. Gossip will tear a place up quicker than you can blink an eyelash. See, we can point out that people who do stuff outwardly and say, well, this is horrible and that's bad and that's sinful and God doesn't like that. But when we start looking at ourselves and the things that we say to one another about somebody. See, I could ask, I could ask a question. Has anybody ever gossiped about you? Everybody would put, put their hand up. Yeah. And I could ask this question. Have you ever gossiped about anybody? And everybody said, oh, not me. Okay. Not a popular. Okay. And finally, the, the last thing he talks about. He that sows discord among the brethren. Troublemaker. They'll go to this one and they'll say, psh, 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 and they'll come over here and they'll say, psh, 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 and they'll go over here. And, psh, 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 and, and the next thing you know, they just stand back and wait for the fist to fly. Anybody ever had that happen to them? Anybody ever do that? Quiet. Okay. Now, when we're reading these things, I know that everybody in here, including myself, I can plug myself in here somewhere, maybe in multiple places. If you want to be honest with yourself, this isn't about, you know, I'm not trying to condemn. If you could plug yourself in there somewhere. And this was written before they had Facebook. <laughs> or MySpace or Twitter or it's written before email. This is when they would have to do it like for real instead of electronically. Still applies. Still applies. Somebody sitting out there thinking, man, I'm getting beat up here. <laughs> you know, I thought I was saved. Now I want to tell you the good news. We're talking about what God hates. 
But what I want to, what I want to focus on is God's love. I say, so God's telling us what he hates. But I want you to get a hold of how great God's love is for us. Because when we read all this, now I'm, I'm speaking to people, I hope are believers. If you're not a believer, then please come up after the service and, and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I hope, I'm speaking to people who I hope are all believers. And you say, wait a minute, what is, what is this about? Because I'm saved, blood of Jesus, and, I'm, 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 and you're reading all these things to me, and you're, and you're trying to remind me of stuff I've done, and you're trying to throw guilt and condemnation. I'm not trying to do that. I want you to understand what God's love is all about. Because I want you to turn with me now over to Paul's letter to the Romans. And over there in chapter 7. And we'll start with verse 18. The Apostle Paul is writing this. Remember the Apostle Paul? wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He gave us everything we believe about the church, every doctrine about church and fellowship and the things that we believe as New Testament Christians really came from the pen of Paul, the doctrine of atonement and uh, uh, justification, and all these things came from him. Listen to what he has to say. He says, For I know that in me, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. If I were left to my flesh, I would be nothing but evil and wicked. You can own that yourself. That, here's what the word says. Our flesh, the wages of sin is what? Death. Those who walk in the flesh will die. Our flesh is that there's no good thing in my flesh. Everything that, that appeals to us, the entertainment industry, the sports industry, politics, they all appeal to the flesh because it, the flesh feels good when it gets what it, what it wants. And we like to feel good. Paul says, in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it that which is good, I know, I find not. You ever find yourself in a position, I want to do right, but I keep finding myself doing wrong. I'm talking to believers. I'm not talking to people who are not saved. I'm talking to people who know Jesus, their Lord and Savior. Now I wake up in the morning intending to do good, but I find myself looking back and saying, wow, what happened? Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Paul, you writing this, Paul? I thought, Paul, I thought you were something. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Notice Paul didn't say the devil made me do it. Oh, the devil made me do it. He didn't say that. He says, as long as I'm in this flesh that isn't redeemed, I have the potential to sin because sin dwells in my flesh. Verse 21. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I want to do right, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. There's a battle that rages inside of me. All that stuff that we read in, in Proverbs chapter 6, the thing that, that, God, that God hates, my, my flesh tends toward that stuff. Talking about people and lying and manipulating and, and bearing false witness and, and a proud look and all these other things. My flesh, that's, that's what it wants. But my mind, my heart, my spirit, my born-again spirit is saying, no, it wants to do the things of God. And there's a struggle, Paul says. He says in verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? How can I escape 
What, what's going to happen to me? I want to do right, but I'm not doing right. And, I, I, and I, feel this, I feel this tug and I feel this struggle going on in my body. What can I do? The other day when Mike and I were talking on the phone, he said, you know, some people say this. This is a saying we always hear. God helps those who help himself. You ever hear that saying? But it's baloney. God helps those that can't help themselves. They can't do anything about it. Because here's what Paul says. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And he goes on and says this in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation. Listen, our only hope to be set free from the law of sin and death is the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. We have no other hope. Self-help isn't going to do it. Rehab isn't going to do it. Uh, going, living on a mountain for 10 years isn't going to do it. The only thing that's going to do it is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the love of God. Because the Bible says God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall never perish. With all that stuff that we do that he that disgusts him, he still sent his son for us. For while we were yet dead in our sins, he loved us. Can you get an appreciation for the love of God this morning toward you? Can you get an appreciation for what a loving God has done for us? He sent his son to be beaten and die on the cross and shed his blood so that we might have eternal life in spite of ourselves. That's great love. That's greater love than you have for your own children. It's great love. And we take it for granted. As I said, some people have... Have, have misrepresented. They think his love is a blank check. Here, go, have a good time. It's not his love. That wouldn't be love. Would you love your, your kid and say, yeah, go ahead, stick your hand on the a, on a, on a stove. Go ahead, that's all right. Have a good time. His love is great. And it's forever. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I want to look one more passage. I'm going to let you all go. All the way back there in Psalms. Look at Psalms. Psalms uh, 51. We all know Psalm Do you know what Psalm 51 is about? It's a psalm that King David wrote after he got busted. King David got busted. You know what King David did? He allowed himself to be taken with a pretty woman. Not that it ever happened to anybody in here. Took that woman, got her pregnant, had her husband killed to cover it up. You read about that story in, over there in 1 Kings or 2 Samuel. I'm not, 2 Samuel. He got busted. The, God sent the prophet to him and said, David, he thought he had got away with it. He thought nobody knew. God knew. God sent the prophet and said, David, you're the man. You've done this sin. David repented. He experienced the love of God because if God would have exercised his judgment, his justice, David would have been, he could have been executed on the spot for adultery and murder. And they didn't have an appeals thing back then. <laughs> but David repented. And he said this in chapter 51. We're not going to read the whole, the whole psalm in verse 10. Create in me. God, let this be your prayer this morning. Believers, if you're not a believer, you can't pray it. But if your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you can say this prayer with confidence, with boldness. You can say, create in me. A clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do you really want a clean heart? Do you really want a new spirit that's different than the old one? See, a lot of folks, they come, they come to the Lord looking for God to do something for them, but when they find out that he wants to change them, they say, well, you know, you hear this thing, well, I want you to be my Savior, but not my Lord. Forget that. If he can't be your Lord, he ain't going to be your Savior. He, he wants to save you and change you. He wants to make you his. He wants to save you from all this sin stuff. 
Can you say with all honesty, I want a clean heart. I want a new spirit. I want to be a different person. I'm tired of of this life. I want something different. Cast me not away, he says, from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore, we talk about a God of restoration. Restore unto me the joy of of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, then will I teach transgressors. Then. See, see, there's a whole lot of folks who want to get up and teach and be, you know. You need to get you a clean heart first. You need to get you a right spirit first. We need to go to the Lord and confess and say, God, I need to be changed. I'm tired of having a froward spirit. I'm tired of, a, of having a proud look. I'm tired of, of, of being rebellious. I'm tired of, of being a, a manipulator and a user. I'm tired. I want to be changed. Then, then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted. Do we want to see a revival in our city? We need to ask for a revival right here. We all know what needs changed out there. We're good. I'm good at pointing out, oh, this needs this. this. But whenever it comes time to look at me, I get all of a sudden my eyes get foggy. Jesus put it like this. He said, before you pull the splinter out of your brother's eye, get that log out your own. I want to pray this morning that we would experience the love of God. And that wherever you're at, you've heard this message and you've heard, you know, you're plugged in somewhere. I am too. See, I'm, I'm going, not going to stand up here and tell you, oh, yeah, man, I've, you know, not me. Everybody else, but not me. That's what we like to do. You know, we think, we'll think everybody in the congregation, oh, that was for this one and that was for this one. You know, in, in the uh, colonial church in America, they used to have people that, when the preacher was preaching, they would shout out who it was for in the, in the congregation. <laughs> we don't have them. I'll let the Holy Spirit do that. Wherever you found yourself plugged in. See, this isn't the message of condemnation. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a message so you will see and appreciate God's love for you. And in doing so, you might take a good look at yourself in the light of God's word, and say, God, I want to be everything you want me to be. How many people would say that this morning? I want to be, I want to be the, the man or the woman you want me to be. I'm willing. How many people were willing to say, I want, I want the old man to go? Well, I'm in love. Amen. We fall in love with that. Old. We, get so, we get so comfortable with misery sometimes. You know, that's what addiction is about. You know, we get so comfortable with that feeling. I've, I've, I've told, I've told the story here. Well, about a month or so ago, I fell and I, I hit my knee. Okay, I fell on my knee. It was hurting. So we had some pain pills at home. We got from a dentist. A rose got from a dentist somewhere. And uh, I said, man, this knee's hurt me. I need to take one of these pain pills. I took a pain pill. And you know what? It made me feel good. I felt good. I, I, mean, I mean, I wasn't high. I wasn't like, huh, I wasn't high. But I felt good. I felt like, man, I felt pretty good. I could see how somebody could get, could get hooked on that. I could see that. Because it really, I tell you what, my knee still hurt, but I still felt good. It did. I felt good. See, my flesh said, hey, that's all right. You got some more than pills in there. Why don't you take another one? Go ahead. Take another one. You feel good. You're kind of down, kind of depressed. Pop one. I said, no. I said, God, I said, no. I said, see, we need, listen, wherever you're at, wherever you're plugged in today to what we've talked about, I want to pray. I know I could have an altar call. Every one of you probably come up here if you're honest with yourself. But I want you to stand with me as we pray. And as always, you know, we're going to pray. We're going to close our service. If you need specific prayer for anything, please don't leave. We're going to close our service and dismiss. 
And then if you want to pray for anything, please just come on up and hang out up here, and we will be glad to pray with you. Myself, Brother Jairus is here, and, and some of the other brothers will be happy to pray with you. But wherever you've plugged yourself in this morning to what we said, please don't be condemned. I don't want anybody to be condemned. I don't want anybody here to be guilt-ridden. But if the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and saying, listen, this is an area you need to deal with, I want to pray this morning. I want to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Your word to us, your love for us is so overwhelming and so outstanding. Father, I pray that, I hope that we've all been able to see just how great your love for us is in the light of these things that you hate, these things that we find ourselves doing. You hate them, yet you so loved us that you gave your only begotten son. Father, I pray that you will allow us to take a good look inside ourselves, not at anybody else, but that we would look inside ourselves because we want to be people of God. Father, wherever we have plugged ourselves in here this morning, whatever we've read in this passage and it has touched our hearts, that has, it has tweaked our spirit, Father, I pray that we present it to you. We bring it to the altar this morning. We, present, we, present, we bring our sin offering to you this morning, Lord. We say, God, cleanse us. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Make me a new creature, O God. Father, we want to be the people of God. We want to be used by, even as we've been admonished this morning, to be able to go forth and tell others. Yes. It's not so much how many people are inside, but how many people are sent. Father, we want to be able to teach others your word and, and show others your truth. But, Father, help us first as we ask for revival. Help us ask for revival in our hearts. Yes. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Yes. Renew a right spirit in me in me, then, then, Father, you can use me to share your word with others. Father, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice here this morning, that we would leave this place with an understanding, that we would be thankful. Father, we're thankful that your love is so great, that you, you're able to, you sent your son, that his blood covers us, that you see us covered in his blood. And even though these things uh, weigh us down, Father, we know that you see us as righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. You accept us in the beloved. Thank you. Thank you. And you've given us the hope that we have. We are able, but through faith in Christ, to overcome the flesh. We don't have to be slaves to sin. The word tells us that we don't have to be slaves to iniquity, but we can overcome through faith in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God, that's our, that's our Savior. That's your love was expressed on the cross. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't, it wasn't good to look at. It was ugly. It was bloody. It was brutal. But, Father, that's where your love is shown to us. You've taken our sin and given us your righteousness. Oh, God, we thank you, Father. Create in us a clean heart. Renew our right spirit within us, oh, God, as we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence, oh, God. There's that song that we sing, Create in me a clean heart.